I am excited to welcome you to today's funded research grant webinar, Residential Students on the Autism Spectrum, Belonging and Inclusion. So Akuhoi is committed to the creation and dissemination of knowledge about campus housing and the broader issues that impact the post-secondary experience, and we need your help to create these critical resources. A funded research grant program was created to support Akuhoi's goal of cultivating knowledge resources for members. The aim of this program is to encourage scholars and practitioners to conduct high-quality research in support of the research agenda areas. Um, financing and association support are available for selected studies that address any of three research priority areas, public-private partnerships, student outcomes, and student success. If you're interested in applying or learning more, you can find information about the funded research grant under research and data in the knowledge resources area of the Aku Hawaii website. Um, and to start, I would like to ensure that we have live transcript enabled, which should now be available. We have a few more people in the waiting room, I'm going to admit. Um, so live transcript feature is now enabled. If you should need to use that during our time today, that is available. Uh, also, please feel free to post any questions you might have in the chat or to hold them until the Q&A time. Um, I will try to moderate the chat, but please know that your questions posted there will likely be answered at the end of our time together today. And I will now turn things over to our oh. presenters. Awesome. Uh, so my name is Joan Collier. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am going to fade to the back in a minute, but I wanted to introduce uh, the other two colleagues. Well, we have three of the colleagues from our research team. We are at Rutgers University, um, New Brunswick. Uh, and on the call from the research team is Dr. Dana Weintraub, who's our director for assessment, strategic planning, and a host of other things in the Division of Student Affairs. Um, Dana, can you wave to the people, please? Thanks, Dana. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Amy Mealy, who uh, works in uh, Title IX um, here at Rutgers New Brunswick. Ames, wave to the cam. And uh, Justin Kelly, who works at Pratt University as Assistant Vice President for something in Student Affairs. Um, that is what he does. And so for this portion of the um, overview, Amy and Justin will be the primary people that you'll engage with. Um, and then you'll uh, be able to um, comment with myself in the chat as you have questions. And then we'll move from this portion where they overview the study uh, to an open Q&A where we can have more grappling and more conversation. So I'm gonna pass it over to um, Amy and Justin. Hey, Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Dr. Collier said, my name is Amy Mealy. I use she, her pronouns. And uh, we first want to start off by just thanking Akuhai for funding this research study. Um, we'll also give a shout out and a thank you uh, to Rutgers University, who has uh, pledged money to help implement some of our findings to um, better the university experience for students on the autism spectrum and specifically within residence life. And before we jump in too deep, uh, we also want folks to know that we were um, awarded our grant back in 2019. <laughs> so before the pandemic um, happened. And so um, this is a little bit delayed for us to be able to share our findings with you all. And we also recognize that times and, and the landscape have changed quite a bit since we started our, our research. So please also keep that in mind. Um, and I guess use that perspective to help guide some of the questions that you might have in the end. Okay, hey, so um, we want to start off by defining some terms. Uh, so you're going to hear that all of us on this call today will be interchanging some terms, students with autism, mm -hmm. autistic students, um, typically in um, the world, but specifically in higher education, um, we advocate for person first language and really what we learn from the participants of uh, this study and beyond is that this is a part of their identity that is who they are and that they're proud of. 
Um, and so using person first language um, is kind of going against who they are, you know, th this is their identity. So um, I want to just put it out there that there's no shame or judgment um, surrounding a, a, the particulars neurotypical status. Um, so if you hear us using the terms interchangeably, that's why. Okay, Justin, do you want to talk a little bit about autism spectrum disorder? Yeah, so just to give you some foundation on um, ASD, uh, we were, we came into this really focused on like definitions and what the research says and what the books say, um, and quickly learned that our students and our participants in the study really were very upfront and honest um, and very direct with us about what it is that, um, how we define ASD, how they wanted us to label it as we, you know, talked about it with them and gone through the interview process. Um, so our definition is a mix of hello, all of that. Can hello. You the door? Hi. Hi. <laughs> so thank you for that. Hello. Um, so ASD. Um, entails difference um, in social emotional reciprocity, nonverbal communicative uh, behaviors, and in developing, understanding, and maintaining relationships. So all of us here are higher ed folks, um, and if you are in a student-facing role, you hopefully um, have been around or interacted um, some in your careers with folks with ASD. Um, and so some of these things you see here uh, listed as part of the definition, um, we really want to focus on the word spectrum. Um, this is, you can be on a very high functioning um, or the other end of the spectrum. So with ASD, it's important to note that, you know, this is, these are very common characteristics of folks with autism. Um, but this stuff can look very different depending on the student that you are with um, and working with. Um, so we wanted to just put this here to give you some, some foundation as to how to define ASD and how it is defined. Um, but we know that it looks very different in, in our students. Um, the number of formal ASD diagnoses continues to rise um, in the US, about one in 44 children are diagnosed with ASD. Um, we also like to remind folks that the diagnosis um, is still relatively new um, in the DSM. I think around 1986, it was formally put there. Um, so not to age myself, but that was the year that I was born um, and, and I am mid thirties. Uh, you can do the math, but a lot of those folks are through college um, and now entering the workforce. Um, and so I think when we, we hear and see the number continuing to rise, um, and a lot of that has to do with how recent um, the diagnosis was, was added to the DSM. So the purpose of our study is really to explore the experiences of belonging and inclusion among residential students with autism. Um, so we conducted our research um, at a suburban research university. Um, the, really, the crux of this study is just to help residents' life professionals. And if we have some non-res life folks on here, that's great, um, because ideally, you know, we are all about universal design and, and getting our, our participants here today to really think about how um, ASD looks not only in the residential spaces, but throughout um, the entire university college campus life. Um, our students you know, with autism have very unique challenges and benefits um, while they're on campus with us. And so while this is really grounded in, in how we can make the residential space better um, and enhance their thriving, um, it is certainly applicable to other folks um, who are working in other areas of higher ed who are here today. Um, nothing about us uh, without us. So that was really a big piece of our study is to make sure that we had 
representation um, from, from all angles. Um, so from developing our research questions um, to you know reading through our findings once we were at that point in the process. Um, so our study did, um, thanks to Akuhoi, we were able to hire a paid research intern um, who identified uh, as a student who had ASD, who was very helpful to us throughout this process and has since graduated. Um, should I keep going, Amy, or you want me to? Go ahead. All right, I'll go one more, one more time. Um, so we had a total of 11 participants, uh, six identified as men, five as women, um, four as straight, three bisexual students, two gay, and two did not identify their orientation. Um, all of, but one or so of our students did identify um, as white. Um, so that something that we did note as a research team is that our study did not um, include many students of color. I think that's really consistent with the current findings out there. There's not a lot of um, research or at least not a lot of existing stuff out there about students, the experiences of students with of color who are on the spectrum. Um, one international student um, and then a mix of first year sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Um, and then the years in on-campus housing range from one to about four and a half. Great, so the data collection consisted of uh, two different phases. The first was journaling. Um, the reason why we had the, um, the process start with journaling is because many of the participants said that they felt more comfortable expressing their thoughts, feelings, and emotions on paper, where they could take some time to really process through things. They could think exactly how they wanted to word it. Um, something to note is that 10 of the participants submitted the journal electronically, whereas one student preferred to handwrite um, all of their prompt, the journal prompt responses. After the journaling, we then interviewed each participant for about one hour, and we tried to make the interview room and space as comfortable as possible. Um, so we did use a white noise machine to not only try and keep the confidentiality of the space and the privacy of the space so that no one else could uh, listen in, but also because there were some students who mentioned that um, they were very sensitive to noise. And so outside noise, whether it be the cars whizzing by or construction um, was a bit distracting and the white noise machine really helped with that. We also used floor lamps to be sensory sensitive uh, in terms of eyesight. Um, we have, you can maybe tell based on my background that we have the fluorescent lightings on the ceiling in most of our offices here, which is uh, where we had uh, done the interviews. And so we turned those off and put the floor lamps, which frankly, um, I enjoyed more myself. So I think that was a big benefit to everyone. Okay, so that's a little bit about our data collection and who our uh, participants are. I know that was very brief, but we really want to jump into the findings and then get to the recommendations so that we can open it all um, for discussion and Q&A. Okay, so in terms of clinical diagnoses, and Justin kind of alluded to this earlier, we have eight participants who received clinical diagnosis of ASD. Four did not. There are a few reasons for that. Um, some students did not um, seek out a uh, clinical diagnosis because they, they really didn't know that it was a possibility that they were on the autism spectrum. Their family that they lived with never um, kind of sought out the process to get them evaluated. The process can also be very expensive if you don't have health insurance. Um, what Justin had mentioned is oftentimes we see that students of color and also women don't uh, receive the clinical diagnosis of ASD, again, for a variety of reasons. 
Um, and all of them, because of societal barriers, nothing that is their own individual barrier. Um, there are um, still some stigma around ASD and um, people who identify as female. Um, the DSM definition and diagnosis cr criteria was based on males. Uh, so it's not completely um, perfect or relevant to anyone who identifies other than male. Um, so Joni, who was one of our participants, again, these are all pseudonyms, of course, uh, they decided not to seek out a diagnosis out of concerns related to the stigma and future employability. Lucy also agreed and said, um, although understanding of ASD has increased in the professional world, there's still a negative trait overall. And they, the two of them really felt that if they had a clinical diagnosis that could somehow impact their future employment. Cass had initially resisted looking into ASD, later sought out clinical consultations. However, they said, if you can make eye contact, you're not autistic, you're able to converse with me, you're not autistic. Um, so she did not end up with a formal diagnosis, even though she did speak with clinicians. So many of our participants had self-definitions of ASD. Yakab said, autism doesn't define the person, the person defines autism doesn't view it as a disability, just as a different mindset, um, which at least everyone on the research team agrees with him there, but I'm sure all of us on, the, on this call could agree with. Tony said, my thoughts overwhelm my mind sometimes, like the noise in my head is louder than everything else. And then Lucy defined autism as a state of being or the way your brain is structured. She said, there's really no no point where my autism ends and I start or the other way around. And accepting autism in yourself is like accepting you for who you are. And, and I think that quote really speaks to uh, how we opened up in the beginning that uh, to the students who identify as being on the spectrum, um, to them saying autistic, I am autistic or you are autistic, um, instead of you are on the autism spectrum, it felt more personal and positive for them because they feel really proud of, of this identity. And our participants said uh, that they view autism as a superpower. So most appreciated their heightened abilities to focus on academics and schoolwork, giving conducive environments and routines. So um, again, all of our participants uh, were college students at the time. And so that was a really a benefit to them that they could kind of hyper focus on one particular task or subject. But again, the conducive environments and routines really had an impact. So if they were trying to study in a noisy residence hall, for example, that decreased their abilities to concentrate, which again, I think we can all relate to. Um, Lucy, said that listening to music evokes mental images and she recreates those images in art. So she was an art student. I think that's really beautiful and a huge positive and, and benefit. Uh, and to me, I'm like, oh yeah, that is a superpower. Um, and then the participants that we interviewed were very, very involved on campus. They completed internships, they worked, they wrote for the newspaper, they tutored, they um, were the leaders of clubs, they supported different groups, they were very, very active on campus. And I just want to chime in on that slide because I think for me that was my favorite part of this process is hearing that from the students. Um, we you know, and I'll admit, like when going into this and going into a lot of the work that I've done with students on the spectrum, um, autistic students, you know, it is very like focused on the deficits. And so this really helped all of us on the research team shift our thinking from this, like, how do we help you with your challenge and really shift the focus to more strength strengths-based approach to connecting them to, to people, resources, programs, et cetera. So um, I think if you don't remember anything from today's presentation, like this is the money-making section um, that I think really um, is the powerful piece. And now being at an art school, um, as I'm at now at Pratt Institute, 
I, I love this whole art piece really um, resonates with me so much because I'm in a world now full of unicorn art students who um, and I know I haven't had the privilege to meet any of them uh, students on the spectrum just yet, but I know they're there and um, I'll always remember this piece from Lucy. So just wanted to add that piece, Amy. So benefits of being on campus, I mean, pretty consistent with um, a lot of existing research about the, the just that, the benefits of living on campus. Um, I think some of that aligned with the feedback that we received from some of our participants. Um, so for example, Becca here mentioned um, that if they weren't living on campus, they don't know if they would have friends um, and felt for the first time in an academic setting that they belonged. Um, for those of us who have uh, specific themed communities, um, Tony um, talked about his experience living in Rainbow Perspectives, which is an LGBTQ plus themed residential community at Rutgers. Um, and Tony said, I'm in a lot of social circles now because of that group. If I didn't live on campus this semester, I probably would not have done as well as I did. Um, so I don't wanna read through everything that's here, but as you can see, most of our participants um, did find that being on campus um, really enhanced their sense of belonging on campus, whether it be through programs, um, a heightened sense of security, um, that they're not living alone, or that the RA and the hall community, the hall staff in the community are not very far um, away in case they needed something, um, but folks really did report a positive um, experience living on um, and really being able to articulate the benefits of their residential experience, um, specifically at our suburban research university. <laughs> and then some difficulties with living on campus. Um, most participants uh, describe their residence hall rooms as being their most comfortable space on campus, but environmental features also distracted from that. Um, so we talked a little bit about setting our space for conducting our interviews um, and focusing on light and noise. Those were some things that did uh, illuminate from our study um, is that our facilities aren't always the most conducive. Um, and a lot of that is not, uh, is outside of the human control of what the hall staff can do. Um, certainly we can enforce policies and we can do a lot of that stuff, but some of our uh, facilities are just very old um, and they are pretty ancient um, and have a lot of original features that they were first built with um, that are sometimes distracting for both, you know, students on the spectrum as well as um, neurotypical um, students. Um, and we've, you know, as someone who's worked in housing and residence, residential life for a number of years, um, I think this is pretty, um, some of these challenges are pretty across the board. Uh, fire drills, fire alarms are extraordinarily disruptive. Um, participants mentioned levels of social anxieties and needing to be um, in more isolated, quiet spaces at times. Um, and then Cass said here, I want to, I want to say that my social anxiety came about not as a result of autism specifically, but as a result of how people respond to autistic traits, such as muttering to themselves or thinking out loud. Um, so while there's certainly a lot of benefits to living on campus, these are some difficulties um, that I think are somewhat within our control um, as leaders and practitioners, specifically in housing and residential life. Um, these are some things that we want to keep on the docket to continue to talk about as new facilities go up or as we look to change um, policies and community expectations, uh, many of our students on the spectrum could certainly benefit. Okay, so I'll jump in here with the programmatic efforts. Um, 
The participants, I will say, really were kind of um, across the board or very different in their thoughts on uh, which programs they found to be fun and useful and helpful and beneficial to them. So things like movie nights, um, art uh, programs, um, something that, uh, video games. I would say overall, one connecting theme that we found is that students on the spectrum, or at least these 11 that we spoke with, they really enjoyed events where they could be around other people without being forced to socially interact with those people. So we're all in community together in the same space, but we're not necessarily doing an icebreaker or a team builder where we have to talk and interact in that way. Um, Justin had opened us uh, up this webinar by talking about the pandemic and how that has impacted this study and the way we do things within higher education. One thing uh, that we saw come up, and again, we collected this data pre-pandemic, was that um, Joni had suggested virtual programming as a more appealing format. And now we know that that is incorporated into all of our lives. So um, this is a little preview to a recommendation that's gonna come later, but the participants in this study helped us recommend um, not to completely get rid of those things that we adapted to during the pandemic and to maybe keep some optional different formats other than just in person. Okay. Um, so for RA training, Amy, can I chime one more time? I'm so yes, sorry. Please. No, yes. I was going to say one of the best programs. I know Pratt just did it in the beginning of the year, and Rutgers has also done it. Is the silent disco? When you read through that one section on that last or this current slide, mm -hmm. um, I think that that's exactly that. People want to be around each other, but they want to do their own thing. So just a little shameless plug for you programmers out there um, love that that disco program. We love uh, a silent disco. Right, to yourself though. Yes, we <laughs> love that, absolutely. Love a good online trivia where people can chat. Um, yeah, we have, we have many recommendations. Um, so for RA training, so one participant had actually been invited one year to partake in RA training um, and uh, shout out to Justin, because I think he may have actually been the person to invite this student to participate. Um, so the student was able to speak on a panel in front of hundreds of RAs talking about their experience on the spectrum and experiences within residence life. He felt like he had a voice that um, he emphasized listening to the residents' experiences. And he also felt like the fact that residence life had invited him to speak on this panel during training showed their commitment to diversity and inclusion and specifically for including neurodiverse students. And I thought that was really um, a kind of like a simple thing that made a big difference where inviting someone to share their perspective um, is not too difficult to organize. You know, it's one person, but really made a lasting impact both on the student speaker on residence life staff and changing the perceptions of the commitment for the entire institution. So RA selection, um, we talked about this in our interviews and some of the participants didn't consider becoming an RA because of um, misinformation. So that could have been regarding compensation. It could have been um, feeling like the responsibilities would be too much. Jay had said, I'm not sure if there's anyone on the spectrum who's an RA. Um, so not really seeing themselves in that role or someone that could represent their community, their identity. Tony had thought about becoming an RA, but was unsure of the process. He had said he heard that you have to go through a bunch of interviews and stuff and that scared him. He was very worried about getting fired or not even getting past the interview stage and not getting hired. Um, I think this is a very real concern for every student 
Um, RA selection processes look very different across institutions. Some of them involve interviews, some involve a group interview process, um, some are more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so um, the participants all kind of took note of that and for those various reasons decided not to become an RA. So just some concluding thoughts for our participants. Um, Lucy had said that the university had a ways to go in recognizing autistic and neurodivergent students. Tass agreed that while campus was diverse, it was not inclusive of autistic students, and that creating a more accommodating world for people with disabilities should guide campus diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, this is, you know, a really common example, um, but you often hear that um, that you might, so let's say like diversity might be inviting different people to a party and then inclusion is everyone dancing together. A little corny, I know we've all heard that before, but I think what the participants are saying is, well, our campuses look very diverse. We know there are nerd, neurodivergent students here. We want to see a commitment from the institution on inclusion efforts, not just we are admitted, but how we are treated and how we experience belonging and inclusion once we're here. Hey, Justin, do you want to kick off the implications for residents' life? Sure. So for programming, um, we did already mention, um, you know, the, the theme here is really broad, broad, and broad. <laughs> um, and we're, we also know that there are a lot of folks represented here and many folks, you know, I, I have friends who are working in residential life and I see how things are already so different. Um, so we just wanna also recognize that many people probably have already implemented a lot of these changes um, for a lot of different student needs and student groups. Um, but as it pertains to ASD, um, you know, mentioning that silent disco uh, as an example of a program that might really align with uh, the needs and, and desires of an autistic student. Um, I think just continuing to be mindful of the various ways and modes in which we roll things out for students. Um, you know, it was really interesting like to be doing this research in the fall semester of 2019 and coming back together as a research team in the middle of the pandemic and recognizing that so many things that we were even implementing or recommending from our research were now things that were very standard in our offerings across the higher ed landscape um, everywhere. Um, so a lot of what we've been doing with virtual programming, communications, and participation, um, I think is definitely um, aligns with what our participants shared with us that they would like to see more of. Um, so it would be interesting to go back to them now to say like, hey, three years have passed. How, how are things for you now um, in terms of engagement opportunities and, and how you can be more engaged. Um, I think really focusing on the fact that people want opportunities to create, to have engagement with other people, but also still recognize that a lot of folks value time to self um, and really not feeling super overwhelmed by a lot of things all at once. Um, Creating channels for family members and support service um, personnel to inform and help with monitoring resource utilization and personal development. One thing that we did um, when I was at Rutgers um, working in residence life, not only did we invite um, students with autism to be a part of the RA training, I would also invite the family members of those students to come in and be a part of professional staff training. Um, because again, I don't identify as someone with autism. So I only know what I have researched and in my professional experience. Um, and I think all of us on the research team, none of us 
di were diagnosed or um, have um, autism. And so really talking more to people um, in the population to find out what their needs are. It's very easy, you know, and I've been guilty of it several times in my career is like, oh, let me create this opportunity or this training or something for this population of people, but not really connecting with them to find out if it's something that even makes sense or if it's aligns with what it is that we're trying to achieve. Um, so when we think about support, find ways um, that we can include uh, opportunities for family members and include students into these program services, ask their opinions, ask what would get them there and get them engaged. Um, clinical documentation is frequent, frequently required to access residential accommodations. However, diagnoses criteria continue to evolve. Um, and I think that's really, really important as we know that some of our students said, yes, I went to the doctor at a very early age or I went, when I was coming to college, um, but for some people, it's like, you know, I self-identified myself as being autistic. Um, and part of what we also heard is that there, and we know there's no medication. There's not like any formal thing that can fix, quote unquote, um, a person with autism. Um, and so just being flexible in um, requiring that clinical documentation um, and sometimes just knowing that morally, like and ethically, if someone's feeling vulnerable enough to share this with you, um, you know, we might have to not be so formal as ASD diagnoses are really expensive and there are a lot of barriers for folks um, to get that. And I think to add on, um, or not to add on, because Justin said this, but to emphasize is that, you know, the reason why there's not um, medications or things to fix is because it doesn't need to be fixed. You know, this is just a different way of thinking and being. And what is even different? We're all different. We all think differently. So this is really a positive. And we, as Justin said earlier, the one thing we want everyone to take away is that ASD is not a deficit, especially to our students who are in college and in our residence halls who are providing so, so much to our spaces and our communities. Okay, so um, for RA and also RHA, the Residence Hall Association Training and Selection, um, develop an expanded understanding of diversity that includes students with autism and other hidden disabilities. So oftentimes we think of diversity in sex, gender, race, sexual orientation. Um, and we also wanna keep in mind those hidden, hidden disabilities um, that we know are very real for our students. Purposeful recruitment of autistic students, I, I think is very important because they may not see themselves in that role. And so if you are purposefully recruiting them and explaining, um, clearing up any misinterpretation, uh, I, that would go a long way. We also want to examine the selection processes and the job descriptions to make sure there's not a disproportionate emphasis on students who can socialize on demand or um, the students who are the most outgoing in the space or who feel the most comfortable um, in team bonding activities. You know, oftentimes it takes people a little bit more time to feel comfortable. And especially um, what we've heard from the participants is someone who is autistic and may not be uh, the most comfortable right away, but you don't want that to hinder them from getting a role where they could really excel and bring a lot to the position. Can I pop in real quick, Dr. Of Miller? Course. So this particular um, recommendation uh, was, is by far my favorite, right? Because it takes the onus off of our students and puts it back on us as the practitioners to say, what about our systems and our structures either invite or disinvite folks with autism to be a part of what we say should be an experience that 
teaches leadership, helps students learn more about, uh, more about themselves. That's my stutter. She comes to hang out sometimes. She's not harmful. Just go with me. Um, you know, it teaches them a lot about themselves, how to navigate structures. And so what about our structures and how we design these experiences create barriers, right, for full participation. And so that means that we have to ask ourselves, what are our own investments in our traditions um, and in the outcomes of participation for students with autism, right, who see, for some who see um, their experience as uh, additive, right? And so how might um, how might we more universally design our processes and then make peace with whatever we need to about the things that we were invested in that we need to let go of, right? So when we have these, oh, I just want to see if, you know, people can pick up and go because in a residence hall, you never know who you're going to have to talk to. And sometimes you just have to talk to anyone. And while that may be true, it's not all the time. And so wanting to be more thoughtful in how we are describing the experiences that we actually uh, expect our RAs and AAs to have, but then actually maybe even second looping around and saying, is it required that all the time our RAs are always on? Like, what about the positions are require them to always be on with so little time for themselves to tend to themselves, care for themselves, not be always available? I know that's one of our marketing things is someone's always available. Yeah, someone, it doesn't have to be that student though, right? And so just thinking about how we frame our experiences for students, be it leadership, be it supervision, whatever it is, how we shape those as either uh, mechanisms for inclusion or exclusion. I'm done talking, back on mute. No, that was amazing. Thank you for that addition. Um, and the last thing that we wanna state is that there shouldn't be any surprises with the selection and recruitment uh, process. So I know that I get very anxious during the job interview process, especially within higher education. We all know that there's two rounds, three rounds and on campus. You could be here for a full day. Sometimes you're staying over. And um, without knowing what the entire process is going to look like at the beginning, it could be really daunting and maybe prevent you from applying for a certain position. And the students feel the same way. They don't want to just know what the very first step is going to look like. They want to know what the entire selection process is going to look like so that they don't feel surprised or shocked every step of the way. And also, since Amy opened the door about our higher ed job processes being 18 rounds, <laughs> so just thinking about how many people we pack into the room uh, for some of those panels. Um, so selfishly, like, I don't ever like when that happens, um, but I can only imagine like how it would feel to have autism and to be uh, I feel like my whole like next opportunity is based on like how well I perform in front of 25 people. <laughs> um, and it's a lot. Um, so yeah, just wanted to share that. And then lastly, our facilities, what we really want to say here is just knock down all the facilities and start from scratch and include you know, a full committee of people to make these recommendations. We know money is extremely tight and we can't always do that. Um, at least not at Pratt. Um, and I know the director of residential life is here. So shout out to Katie Hale. Um, but, you know, whenever possible, if we can consider facility enhancements um, from this perspective um, and from this point of view, um, again, include students in on the process um, and have those regular meetings uh, with our facilities folks who are oftentimes really great, you know, and expert at, experts at what they do, um, but also just making sure that we bridge that gap um, so that we get more voices in the room because some of these very, uh, what I call low-hanging fruit changes um, are really big ones to some of our students who are occupying these spaces. Um, so, you know, what color light bulbs we use and what areas are lit. Um, 
And when we have the opportunity to designate low sensory quiet rooms or spaces in residence halls or academic buildings, I think those are recommendations that our students need and have asked for. Um, but we know based on what we know of autism that those things are super uh, important to the assessing how well and how much our students are thriving in campus life. Um, and then whenever possible, um, share advanced notices of fire drills. Um, I know this is something that I've always strived to do. It doesn't always happen or work out that way, but whenever we can do that, um, to allow students advance notice so that they can prepare and not be triggered um, in the event of a warning or, or some sort of drill within the halls. And yes, lastly, you know, we love to end how we started. I know Dr. Mealy mentioned this, but if you've met one person with autism, you've met literally just one person with autism. Um, the definition is there uh, as a framework and as a foundation, um, but we know that the reason why this is considered a spectrum disorder is because students could really be from one end to the next and anywhere in between. Um, and so not boxing up um, and packaging our work around supporting autistic students uh, with, with just one idea um, in mind, recognizing that there are lots of different options on the menu and working with this population. Um, and I believe that is concludes our, our formal presentation. Thank you for joining us and we will take any questions that time allows us to take. And feel free to also use the uh, chat feature for your questions as well. Can I stop sharing my screen just so we can see everyone's faces and names? But if anyone would like us to go back to the slide, just let us know. Hi, I don't have any question, but I have a comment of how wonderful this presentation is. I'm Vanessa. I work in campus life. Um, as a, a parent with um, a kiddo with autism, he's a tiny human being. Um, so it's fun to hear or interesting to hear um, individuals or, you know, that's on the spectrum that is like college level because it helps me as a parent prep mentally for um, what that looks like and things that we can work on as a young kiddo um, up to that span of time. And I know, you know, we're a long way from all of this stuff, but it's it's definitely interesting to hear um, and see this research um, in live action. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I would, I actually work with Vanessa. This is Gina. Um, she, hers. And I also wanted to thank you because um, I work at UMBC and I also have a high school senior who is um, on the spectrum. And so all of these things have really been weighing heavily on my mind. And you, I mean, you probably couldn't see me because you had your screen up, but I was shaking my head yes to all the responses, all of the recommendations. Um, I think you guys did a great job. Um, and while it, he is just one autistic person, um, a lot of the things you hit, I think will be very helpful to bring at least to my university, um, to, to talk a little bit about including neurodiversity with the other, um, you know, we're very inclusive, we're very diverse university, but I noticed just having been there for six months that neurodiversity isn't quite equal with the others. So this will be really interesting to bring back to them. Thank you for joining us, Gina. I think oftentimes it's maybe not even a part of the conversation, um, but I'm glad um, that you and your colleagues are here today to make it a part of the conversation.
So we have a question in the chat and then we see your hand up, Ashley. The question in the chat is from Jasmine. It says, how can we ensure that people with autism feel secure and heard when conflicts arise within the residence halls? Um, Title IX, take it away. <laughs> Yes, so I currently work in the Title IX office. As you probably all know, we handle reports related to sexual misconduct, dating and domestic violence, stalking, other forms of um, misconduct. Prior to my role in Title IX, I worked in the Office of Student Conduct, so conflicts arose um, there all of the time, roommate conflicts, and then also code of student conduct violations. So I will speak from my perspective and then throw it to Justin because I know he has um, a lot to share as well in his student support roles. Um, so I think one thing to make uh, students feel secure and heard is number one, before the conflict even arises, to make sure that everyone is aware of the um, I won't say like rules and policies, but even more than that, of community agreements and guide, community guidelines. So autistic students tend to be, um, not always, but tend to be very rule oriented. And so if they, they um, feel very strongly that quiet hours should be enforced and that everyone should abide by, abide by quiet hours, um, they want to follow policies. And so sharing that information ahead of time in a clear manner, avoiding colloquialisms, because as we know, we're all kind of speaking different languages, even when we're speaking the same language. So be very clear in that way. Keep in mind that autistic students may have more social difficulties than neurotypical students. So they may find themselves in situations where they are being documented for stalking or maybe other odd behaviors. And so a way to have them feel seen and heard is to have someone actually meet with the student. So sometimes we can find that maybe student conduct offices are offering um, decision letters over email, things like that. For this population, an in-person meeting or a virtual meeting, something just face-to-face -face with a live person could really go a long way to say, I hear you, I understand, um, I validate what you're saying. And also here's what we need your behavior to look like in order to be successful within the residence halls or on campus in general. Justin, what would you add there? Yeah, I mean, I think um, something, you know, as simple as making it known in your policies and, and your procedures that if students have certain accommodation needs that who are those people and where can they go to um, to access those those advocates um, I think is really really important um, I think a lot you know I operate whether this is right or wrong I operate a lot on like my gut feelings about certain things and so if I pick up on a situation where a student um, seems to be having a difficult time interpreting policies, procedures, or not really communicating that much in one of these processes, um, you know, I think it's really important for us to maybe time out um, and figure out, you know, is there another way that I need to be doing this, or should I reach out to this student separately, um, and really dig a little deep. Um, I think with this, we know that some students have fears about getting diagnosed or really outing themselves. They don't want people to know. And so they're also battling a lot of that as they're incoming, um, coming into college life. Um, and just think about a lot of the common conflicts and challenges that some of our first year students face. They really might not be in a position to talk about um, or to really articulate like, how to navigate a conflict with a peer or how to speak up and advocate for themselves. Um, and so using these opportunities um, as a way to kind of coach and guide them a little bit, I think will really has really gone a long way. And, and back in the day when Amy was in her prior role and I was working in residence life, Amy was the conduct officer. And so sometimes she would invite me in um, to be 
like just another fly on the wall with a student. Um, and those, I think, were some really positive and just heartfelt really moments that we've had navigating conduct um, situations. And it was all because Amy created a process that really allowed for me to be in the room with students. Um, so if your process is siloed in that way, I would really encourage folks to um, take a different approach um, as it really could make a world of a difference for the students um, going through it. Those were wonderful. I think we're coming up on our last question, which is going to be Ashley. If you have other questions, please drop them over in the text, uh, over in the chat, and we'll try to follow up later. Ashley, it's on you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Sardik, and I work at Muhlenberg College um, in residence life. Um, one of the challenges I think that we are facing um, across the institution um, is negotiating the institution parent and student relationship. And so what we're finding is that um, uh, currently, um, we have students that identify as on the spectrum, and they're wanting, you know, for the first times in their lives to sort of independently navigate um, life and connect to resources as they want to. But then we're having parents that are calling and are saying, no, my student has to connect, or my student has to do these things, or the institution is not serving, you know, my student enough. And so I just wanted to know um, if that came up in the study at all, um, or if anyone had any suggestions on sort of how they like navigate that obviously like within the lens of FERPA and different things like that but wanting parents to you know feel like they are supported but then also feeling you know students to know that they can have that in, in you know independence to really you know what I mean at the institution make the experience what they want it to be and flourish um yep yeah I find that sometimes you know parents gonna parent right and so <laughs> In the way that we, you know, redirect parents and loved ones' energies around a lot of things, you know, now they got to be this major. Oh, actually, they don't, but okay, whatever. Like we're gonna work it out. Encouraging um, our students, uh, particularly those for whom there's ongoing oversight, because the K twelve system looks different, right? So I also have ADHD, so my brain jumps. I would say sorry, but I'm not. So our K-12 system looks very different in that in K-12, it's much closer. You get to, you know, higher ed, grown folks said is we purposefully detach people. And so parents and loved ones have been intimately connected to their students, you know, now in higher ed in a way that they are not able to um, engage and curate. And so somewhat serving as, I don't say a barrier, but as a buffer, right, to say, so the student was probably still in ongoing conversation, right? With their parents or loved them, whoever that is, uh, to create space for them to just figure things out and work in a supported environment actually matters. But yeah, there's always a extra engagement. Yeah, that we are trying to buffer for and not in a derogatory way. And I know we're at time. I will offer that um, folk support systems are their support systems. Dr stripping people from those is actually not useful. Our inclination to how we invite students to invite their parents and loved ones to engage in a way that keeps us in compliance because we like our federal and state dollars, amen, is important. It's just not going to be the way it looked in K-12. Um, but yeah, I see some other good questions, but that's time up and we don't want to overstay our welcome. So back to the Akuho Y team. Thanks y'all so much for welcoming us with all your good energy on today's call and uh Hit us up if you need anything. Please reach out to Amy or Justin. You can reach out to Dana or myself. And shout out to Flo Hamrick, who was a faculty member who is now retired, uh, who was our prior, who was our initial PI um, on this grant. And thank you to Akuhai for making this grant possible for our research to move forward. Thank you, everyone. Um, this was being recorded, and the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel. And I've had a request to share it with registrants. So once that is available, I am happy to send out an email to all of you with that link. Um, and if our presenters are willing to share their PowerPoint, I could also share that at the same time as the link to the recording. All right. Thank you for attending. <laughs>